what are boards looking for right now, and especially from COOs? So it may be helpful if I can set sort of the context of what's happened in the boardroom, both it, its data is more specific to public boardrooms, but it actually has an influence on private. So over the last eight years, there's been huge composition shifts. And in fact, consistently since 2020, 35 to 40 percent of public directors appointed are first time directors. And in that construct, a high percentage of them are not CEOs or CFOs. So you have new directors sitting around a table, many of whom have not sat in a CEO chair, but are very expert at an area or a specific place in which they're bringing um, their insights to that boardroom. It's very strategic. They're around the table for very important reasons. But because you have this dynamic shift happening, it's critically important that the COO in partnership with the CEO and the leadership team really help guide the board in what some of the key strategic decisions are that are facing them. Um, but to do it in a way that is both educational but leveraging that boardroom to be able to help answer questions around supply chain, policy, regulatory. Linda and I were talking yesterday about just this dynamic change. Yeah, I think it's incredibly important that you are looking at boards that have these areas of expertise. When I built the Blue Apron board, I brought on a CHRO because we had a lot of frontline employees and I needed that expertise. She also happened to be a lawyer before, so it was a perfect combination. I had a COO slash president who had marketing expertise but also understood how to bring um, you know, the, the supply chain to customers. And I had CFOs, et cetera. But I built my board intentionally that way. The Ralph Lauren board is built the same way where you have different areas of expertise globally. And that balance is really, really important. But there's another dynamic as well, which is the public-private. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I've been a private company COO, a public company COO, and then eventually a public company CEO. The private company boards are much more hands-on, much more involved. They're usually investors. They are bringing more and more independent members on as they think about the future of the business, right. but they're going to be involved day to day, whereas the public company board intentionally is set up to be a governance body and not involved in managing the business on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're supposed to let management lead but stay on top with oversight. Right. That creates a very different dynamic of how you're going to interact with those two different boards. That, what is it, the hands out, noses in? Yes, That's exactly. Um, and so actually I'd love to talk about communication with the board and I'd love to find out from the audience here, not only can you please like think about questions that you have for our experts is a great opportunity. But also, just a show of hands here, when you communicate with your board, do you speak through the CEO or do you speak directly to the board? So if you, if you talk mostly to your board through the CEO, can you raise your hands? Okay, great. And if it's through the, I mean, if, you're, if you have a direct connection to the board. Oh, so, wow, that's a, is that a change, Tierney? No, I actually think boards are seeking to understand the leadership team of an organization. Historically, they may have gone through the CEO, but it's so important now to understand the end-to-end -end of the business. So one of the things that we're observing is in those engagement with the senior leadership team, they're asking that you not just present the slides, but you come in with specific questions or areas to pursue or insights that you're looking for them. And that engagement has created an incredible dynamic that's really positive. So boards want to understand the leadership team for multiple reasons. You just heard in the last session, succession is on everybody's mind. So they're thinking two, three, four years out. Who are the individuals that are going to be around that table? Are there internal candidates for CEO? Do we want to better understand who they are? So that provides an opportunity. But also, just as you're going through shifts, a board wants to understand the team of the CEO and the CEO of the team and how they work together. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's important to understand that as you think about that direct relationship, that doesn't mean free reign. <laughs> so the worst thing that you can do is come into the boardroom or speak to board members and disagree and present politics into this entire situation. Okay. So not just the COO aligned with the CEO, but frankly the CFO, the general counsel, have your discussions and your sort of arguments or debates outside of the boardroom right. and bring a united front because everyone looks weaker if you don't necessarily um, come in at least with some alignment. That doesn't mean you can't come in with a slightly different perspective, but I think it's just really, really important to think that way. Great CEOs will encourage right. their COOs 
and the rest of their executive team to have a direct relationship. And so that direct relationship is extremely important. But you want to be seen as somebody who understands long-term vision and strategy, really focused on ex execution, but arm in arm with the rest of your team. That's great advice. And, and so what strategies would you suggest for building those relationships? Is it like going out for dinner? Or is it, you know, what, what sort of happens outside the boardroom? And you've been a CEO. I think most of this has to be led through the direction of the CEO and the board chair or the lead independent. Because, and, and there are very high functioning boards that have a regular cadence of spending time with management, either on a social basis before the board meeting itself. Uh, they may go to a site where a C-suite leader is based to explore a, a new innovation, new technology, um, sort of work through a, a challenge or an issue. So the board and the CEO are working very conscientiously about building those opportunities to actually understand the human, not just the leader and the, the, the area that they are overseeing. But I'd be curious how you did it, because you were very successful with Blue Apron. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because I know it sounds strange, but that board dinner the night before the board meeting is incredibly important because that is a great opportunity for the COO, um, who usually is invited along with the CFO um, to that dinner, to build that relationship and, and have a little bit more of a casual interaction. But I would actually say overall, again, working with the CEO and, and saying, okay, let's have a regular sort of structured way for the COO to be involved with the board is a little bit better. Because if you think about it from a board member perspective, they could have seven or eight of these types of dinners if it's always a dinner. And I, I will say, I mean, I love food, you know, that I was a Blue Apron. But it's really hard to talk and eat at the same time, uh -huh. it turns out. So you just wind up in a little bit more of a difficult situation than just having a casual conversation and saying, okay, let's build this relationship. But your CEO can structure that time to be most respectful of the board member, but also most respectful, most respectful of you to let you have the right interaction on strategic issues. And that should be part of your development plan. You know, the, for the previous panel talked a lot about strengths and weaknesses. I think that's incredibly important. It's also important to say, not everything is perfect. Um, while everyone should be arm in arm, if you are always just presenting, as they call it, the dog and pony show, there's always the positive, this is everything that's going really well, aren't we great? You lose credibility. So making sure that you're balancing where there's challenges, where there's opportunities and things that need to be done in those conversations um, is, is critical to that. But the CEO should be assigning out and saying, here's when you're gonna meet with these different people and making sure that you get the exposure you need. In a private company, it might be slightly different because oftentimes yes. the board members are there for very specific purposes. So they may be working hand in hand with the COO, if, for example, if they're leading the transformation yes. of a business or if they're thinking about investment in technology and that, that and how that's gonna work. So in those situations, they may be very, very hand on uh, hand working together to solve a problem. Okay, great. And, and speaking about development, are there specific skills that you could suggest to a COO to go and pick up or to learn more about maybe AI or cybersecurity, that kind of thing, where boards are going to be like pressing harder for answers? So, and I was listening to the, the previous panel a little bit. I think what most boards really want to understand from a COO, and, and there are different types of COOs, so I respect that, is do you understand the end-to-end -end of the business? If you're in the C-suite, yeah. do you actually understand the pull? And could you understand the priority choices that need to be made and the trade-offs that need to be made? Because the CEO role is so different today than it was previously. They're so focused on the external stakeholder management and the external uh, affairs that they need somebody in that C-suite chair and on that C-suite team who's really thinking about what are the puts and pulls and how do we drive through the business for today, but at the same time, constantly thinking about that dexterity of thinking short and long term is what we were talking about earlier. Um, followership is huge. Yeah. A board will not elevate somebody into a CEO role or even to a CEO role if they didn't believe they have followership from the, the, the company below. How do they demonstrate that if you're a COO? I mean, it's, it really is about listening, first of all. It's also a lot about resilience. I mean, a big part of what you were talking about is resilience. The board is looking for adaptability from a COO, but frankly, so is the team. You want somebody who doesn't like, get distracted and isn't, paying, you know, as they call it, the swoop and poop of everything. This is the <laughs> latest thing that needs to happen. And 
we're gonna focus over here, we're gonna focus over here. You want a constant force that helps people understand what is the vision for this business and how are we progressing against it in every level of the business. They should understand how we're actually performing against it. And I think that followership is so important because you want someone who can develop the ability to bring people along even in times of difficulty, but attach them to the business, not to them personally. Mm -hmm. okay. It isn't about me, 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 me. That shouldn't be true at any level. It's about how do you actually bring people along with the entire business. Yes, they will be followers of that leader, but how do you attach them to the greater mission and vision? And I think this is something that a lot of people get confused about because everyone says we want to be long-term. We want to think about the long-term vision. Of course we all want to think about the long-term vision. If you are in a public company or even if you're in a private company, you also have short-term goals. That doesn't mean you're thinking short-term. Okay. It means you're staying attached to that longer vision and you have milestones and progress against that goal. You can't come to a board and say, five years from now, we're gonna be growing again. It's right. gonna be great. <laughs> Just trust me, come back to you in five years. What you're saying is, okay, here's how we're gonna get to there in those you know, two, three, five, whatever it is, um, vision years. Here's what's gonna happen each quarter, what we can prove internally and externally that is also a part of followership. People want to be a part of something that they understand and they see the progression. And don't just read the data, right? Don't just give them everything that you've already given them on paper. Yeah. No, no. Right. Because most people can't translate that to the level at which they need to translate it to. Okay. There's a lot of fear. We've talked about it here. There's a lot of excitement and inspiration that technology is bringing to businesses. Equally so, there's a lot of fear. And so how do the senior leaders sort of break it down in pieces that everybody understands this is going to be a positive net for the organization, for the business, for the opportunity, um, and bring them along that way. The, and, the, and the market is moving so fast. Right. Um, you know, look at the last four years. Who would have predicted all of the dynamic changes and forces that have impacted business from COVID forward? None of them were on anybody's yeah. real scenario planning. Maybe the supply chain shortage was, but yeah. not in the way that it, 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 it happened. Right. So because of the movement and because of the pace, how do you slow down to bring people along to go faster is a critically important role that the COO and the senior leadership team are playing in partnership with the CEO. Great, okay. Now let's see if the audience has any questions. Speaking of board questions, if you, can you, if you raise your hand, uh, Somebody will bring a microphone to you. I think one of the previous um, panel's comments was, you know, can you think about COOs stepping into boardrooms? Yeah. yeah. And absolutely. I think as long as your CEO and your board are supportive of it, and the biggest question they'll ask may be time and role and what are the business issues today that are being faced. You know, from a board's perspective, they are absolutely looking for people who understand the end to end of the business. Yeah. So that PL mindset, which you heard about before, is critically important. If you aspire to be a CEO and they can grab you before that elevation happens, that can be also a really positive opportunity. There are many COOs that love being the partner to the CEO and they bring incredible wisdom and depth and uh, operational excellence. And that's also really powerful too. So I think they're, the role of the COO has evolved over the last several years and it can be an incredible anchor in an organization during periods of rapid change. And I think that communication with your CEO about your goals and what, you're, what you are looking to do is incredibly important. Similar to the fact that the CEO should be helping you have relationships with your board and helping to facilitate those, they also can help facilitate you getting on another board. Um, but where I see a lot of COOs maybe make a little bit of a mistake is saying, I wanna be on the board of the company that I am the CEO, COO of. That's actually not necessarily your best learning opportunity. Your best learning opportunity is to be on a board of a different company where the, that knowledge and that experience is different enough that you can actually navigate um, and learn from both. You know, I, I'm a, on the board of Ralph Lauren. I was also the CEO of several fast-growing pure technology companies. And so you have this, this balance of learnings from both that you can apply back and forth. And that's a very healthy balance, healthier than necessarily being on the board of the company you're actually already the CEO on. And if you don't have that relationship with the CEO where you're going to ask about being on a board, how do you go about getting a board seat if we just switch, switch gears a little bit? 
That's a really interesting question because I think from our standpoint, if we're working with a board and we want to talk to a candidate, the first question we're going to ask is do you exactly. have the permission of your CEO? Okay. Yeah. So if there's a dynamic tension in that relationship, you know, that is one that um, is bigger than just can I have a board seat? It's really are, are you, is your relationship in a place where it's going to be most beneficial to the, the organization and, and the strategic objectives? Um, I think there's lots of board readiness education out there, but the biggest opportunity is just to talk to other board members. The, one of the things that we hear a lot from folks who have stepped into either a singular board role at, while they're walking in a, in a company or they're building a board portfolio is they don't understand the time commitment. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that, that it's really not four meetings a year if it's in a public setting. There's right. a lot more in between. Um, it requires tremendous time and attention to be thoroughly um, aware of the issues and the topics that are going to be coming so that you come prepared. Uh, and when that isn't there, uh, board members around the table are going to notice it. And so be really intentional about why you're seeking that board role. It may be for professional de development. It may be something that your board, to your point, has said, hey, we see you as a CEO candidate. This will be an incredible gift for you as you think about the role of management and governance. Um, it may be because you're strategically interested in certain business areas and you think you can add value. But be really thoughtful about the why, because um, motivations matter. Yeah, and, and I will tell you, as a CEO, it's always scary when somebody comes to you and says, I want to take on two or three boards. Yeah. You have to know how much time you're going to be spending. And sometimes private boards actually take more time than public boards, right. just because you are doing a lot more hands-on coaching. So really start with one, give your best energy to both your day job and that board, and it should be an easy conversation with your CEO if you can say to them, I want to take on a board because I think the knowledge I will gain from that board will better help me grow and develop this business, my full-time job, along with help you with working with the board as well. Most CEOs are very open to that and want that as long as people are understanding the time commitment. You know, it's interesting. Um, this morning we learned that AI agents probably wouldn't be good board members, right? Because they, <laughs> they're too agreeable. But I wonder, are COOs sort of uniquely set up to have that kind of productive conversation where there's still some friction when they're talking, to, you know? I think constructive debate in a boardroom is encouraged. Yeah. It, it allows for the right questions to be asked and the right discussions to be had. Right. And that's where it's so critically important for the CEO and the board chair or the lead independent who are setting the agenda and the C-suite team supporting that is, what are the questions we need to put on the table? What are the issues that we want to be wrestling through? Because you don't want a board to be surprised and you don't want a management team to be surprised by how a board reacts. So constructive debate is healthy. Right. Credibility is number one, and you don't get credibility by not having constructive debate. Right. I think that is the way that you get to the CEO seat. That's way you, the way you grow within your COO seat if you just want to if you want to stay there. Um, it's also the way that you get other boards. It has to be a critical discussion. And so, one last piece of advice I'll ask for is um, if you are wondering how you're performing in front of the board, you're not quite sure. How, how do you know if you're doing a good job? Like, I guess the CEO might tell you or the lead chair. The CEO, if you're an executive and you are presenting to the board, the CEO should tell you. But I will tell you most board evaluations include, there's, so there's a board evaluation of the board, there's a board evaluation of the CEO, and when the board is evaluating the CEO, they are also going to talk about the impact of the rest of the executive team. Okay. But keep in mind, like that will be part of the CEO's evaluation. So if the CEO has not done a, a good job developing their team mm -hmm. to be a good presence in front of the board, that will be a reflection on the CEO. So the CEO should be giving you coaching and counseling all along. Um, it may come directly from the board members as well, depending on the relationship you have with the board. But for the most part, it should come through the CEO. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Fantastic takeaways, I think, for, for everyone here.